when I was in elementary school, if you wanted to start a fight, you would get a stick or something like that. And you'd put a stick on your shoulder and you tell your opponent, knock that stick off my shoulder. And it was on, then you were ready to fight. Or if they said something about a member of your family, something like that, they would go into, go into war. It was amazing to me how we would fight and battle over such trivial things. And when I think about the world that we're living in today, I believe that whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, liberal or conservative, black or white, we're doing the same things. We are not preserving humanity, but we are fighting over the, the most trivial things. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered what it took for Jesus to turn the other cheek, to be criticized and physically attacked and not raise his hand to fight back? When I think about Christians today, they always act as if they have this point that you could reach where they forget about being Christian and they take matters into their own hands. What was it in Jesus that gave him the capacity to stand up, tell the truth, speak the truth, suffer persecution, scandal, ridicule, violence, and not retaliate. Was he weaker than his opponents or was he stronger? We all know the answer, he was strong. Are you willing to secure that same kind of inner strength? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight as we continue with part two, survival skills in the age of conflict. We're going through more and more of it, it seems. But I believe that there is enough wisdom and enough grace to handle it. I, before we go any further, we have one more week after this one where we're reading together the book of Proverbs. I hope that you are reading whatever the corresponding day of the month that you're reading that proverb, that you're taking notes, and that we're all being filled with more wisdom by the Holy Spirit at this time. Thank you for joining us for Wednesday's Edification. I'm John Borders. We call this Edify 2.0. And welcome to the Morning Star Experience. We're about to go into worship and the Word. Join me now in the Word of Prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the long-suffering nature of Jesus Christ. I'm a beneficiary. We are beneficiaries of His steadfast love and mercy. We are inspired by Christ's example. We are blessed and strengthened by His Spirit. And we long to walk in His wisdom. So, oh Lord, bless tonight's study. I believe that there's someone watching or will watch tonight's lesson who is in the midst of tremendous conflict. And by doing what they learn, following what they know, that they'll not only come through it, but they'll be stronger. You will promote them to higher levels of spiritual authority and favor and blessing. So bless our lesson tonight. Consecrate all that we do. Consecrate this hour and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tonight we have come to glorify God. We've come to exalt him. We've come to lift him. We've come to magnify him and declare that there is no God like our God. There's no God that's greater. There's no God that's stronger. There's no God that's more lifted or magnified. And so we have come to make declaration tonight of who God is. And so we magnify him, we glorify him, and we declare our God is great. 
Come on, wherever you are, I want you to say that. Our God is great. Hey! Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none. the darkness you shine and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you we say our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, we say our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, we say now, and if our
Greetings family. Want to know what's happening? Where to find help? Or maybe, just that one thing you always wanted to get involved in? Well, welcome to News of the Star. Women's Ministry invites you to Masterclass, the final season. The sessions will be taking place May 13th through August 27th. On May 13th at 6 p.m., here at the church outside in the Vistaview foyer, with Sister Valerie Simpson. On May 14th at 10 a.m., the aspirants will be meeting, outside in the Vistaview foyer with Minister Valerie Anderson. On June 11th at 10 a.m. at Castle Island, with Minister Laverne Pina. On June 25th at 10 o'clock, at Wollaston Beach with Reverend Pamela Haley Gillard. On July 16th at 10 a.m. at Franklin Park with Pastor Dorothy Isles Smith. On July 30th, at 10 a.m. at Castle Island with Rev. Ruthenia Tukes. On August 13th, at 10 a.m., at Franklin Park with Rev. Gillian Thomas, and on August 27th, at 10 a.m., at Franklin Park with Rev. Gwendolyn Spence. Because Morning Star cares, we need your input. We need to know the types of health issues we should address, and your opinion on our programming. Please check your email for a link to a quick survey. If you don't receive our newsletter, now is a great time to sign up. Go to our website www.morningstarboston.org homepage, scroll down, and click the link to sign up. If you want reminders and alerts via text message, grab your phone and send the message, text me, to 617-586-0623. For more information on these and other events, please follow us on Facebook at Morningstar Boston, Instagram at Morningstar Boston, and Twitter at MSBCBOS, and you can always visit www.morningstarboston.org. Remember, this year we are rediscovering the core values of our faith. This year, we are focused on foundations. Please join me now in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, open now our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from thy word. We apply our hearts and minds, our hands and feet, to your commands. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you have something to write with. This is an important, very practical lesson tonight. I hope you will reach out to someone. Why don't you do it right now? Take a moment and send a friend, a family member, a text. Maybe someone you've recently had conflict with and you're trying to reconcile. Why don't you take a moment now and send them a text and let them know to join us on the various social media sites as we share with you now the Word of God. We are studying the book of Proverbs. And over the next month, we are reading Proverbs. Over these last few weeks, we've been reading Proverbs based on the corresponding day. So whatever that day is, that's the proverb number that you will read. Even though I am pulling from different aspects of the book of Proverbs, as well as other scriptures, I found one of the main themes of interest for me, and I hope for you, is how we use our words and how we deal with our words. When we began this series, I told you that we were going to, dis going to discuss conflict resolution. But after looking at the growth of conflict globally, I couldn't just talk about conflict resolution. I wanted to talk about surviving conflict because there's conflict all around us now. Seems to be conflict everywhere. Tonight we're going to dig into something very interesting. Say there is you and then there's someone barking at you. There's someone who has hostility or conflict with you. 
and you're trying to bring peace, and you're doing everything you can to calm the situation down, to, to eliminate the argument, to diminish the hostility, to walk away. This person who's barking at you, screaming, now may have drawn a crowd, maybe people around, and you're trying to do God's will. You're being the Christian. You hold your peace while this person is barking. The peers, the supporters of this barking individual, now want to make you look weak because you're doing what's right in the eyes of God. So what we're going to look at tonight is how is it that you can overcome appearing in your own eyes as weak in the face of conflict and foolishness. So tonight, we're going to discuss survival skills in the age of conflict, part two. And our scripture is the same as last week, Proverbs 15, one through four. Let me read it to you again. A gentle answer, a soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, I love that, keeping watch over the wicked and the good. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. As we said last time, we'll look at this passage of scripture. Again, let me make a couple of comments, starting with verse four and working my way backwards. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. God is saying this, and we're very clear in the word of God, that harsh language, harsh talk, a, a tongue that seeks to do that seeks to speak evil can break your spirit, can really hurt your heart. But God is watching. The eyes of the Lord are, are everywhere. God is able to discern the intent of your heart. And you're not responsible for what anyone else does. You're only responsible for what you do in the eyes of God. So remember, speaking kindly, gently, speaking with tolerance, speaking with patience, speaking in a calm tone of voice will quell every harsh moment of conflicts, whether it be right away or whether it takes some time. The last time we talked, I spoke, I spoke with you a lot about the evil around us. And Satan always wants to win. Satan is after your character. Satan wants to break your spirit. And those that you are in conflict with are often being used by Satan to win the argument, to assassinate your character, to throw you off, off balance, to make you feel small in your own eyes. And you are determined to speak in the spirit of God, to do what's right when your faith is put to the test and to speak calmly and lovingly and patiently. We want to open this up a little bit tonight and share with you some practical advice on your position. And let me say you are right. When you hold your peace and you let the Lord fight your battle, you are in the position of power. The Bible says the meek, Psalm 34, the meek shall inherit the earth. You are in the position of power at that time, but it may not look like it. Your appearance may appear, your appearance may be one of weakness, but you are in the position of power. I want to encourage you to remember that when conflict is at its worst. So let me ask you a question. What does a soft answer say about the person who delivers it? 
when there's conflict going on between two people and one is delivering a soft, gentle, and meek spirit in the matter, what does that say about the person who is speaking in a gentle and calm spirit? I want to encourage you about that because you may walk away from that situation feeling defeated, embarrassed, ridiculed. Someone may have laughed at you. Or it may just have been you and that other person. And although they are wrong or although their motive is wrong, they walk away feeling like they won the argument, that they beat you up a little bit. But what does that really say if you can hold your peace in the midst of conflict? Whether it be a, a fellow worker, whether it be a spouse, whether it be a friend in school, whether it be a neighbor, what does that say about you when you are able to remain calm and quell the argument? and hold your peace. You may want to write these things down. One, you are using wisdom. Because you could easily lose your temper. You are possessing wisdom at that time. You're thinking about the word of God. You're thinking about how you must answer to Jesus Christ. And you're using wisdom at that time because you know that a soft answer turns away wrath. Whether you're relying upon a passage of scripture, I'm not sure. Whatever the Holy Spirit has to do at that time, you are the one in control. You are the one in charge of the situation because you are using wisdom. Number two, you understand meekness. You understand what it means to be meek and humble. I would rather remain humble in a given situation than to lose my temper any day of the week. When you lose your temper, when I lose my temper, where is Jesus Christ? He is nowhere to be found. But when you, able, when you are able to remain calm, when you are able to be meek and humble, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength restrained. That's what meekness is. It's having the power to lash out, but having the wisdom not to lash out because it's unproductive. And you want to gain, you want to be productive in every conflict. You want to be productive in everything you do in the eyes of God. So you understand the power of meekness. You know what it is to use wisdom, and you know what it is to be meek. Now, while all this is going on, the devil, the accuser of the brethren, is barking at you, whether it be one person or many, they are raising their voice, they are barking, their, their eyes are bulging and their spittles coming out of their mouth as they're yelling and screaming at you, and you're there remaining meek and being humble and calm. And they're only more disturbed about it because they want you to step into their territory and fight their fight. So secondly, you're, you understand the power of meekness. Thirdly, you recognize worth. Now this is deep what I'm going to say to you now. Say someone has a conflict with you. And they are people that have conflict regularly with people. And now it's your turn. I remember once in the Mattapan Dorchester line, there's a skating rink there, and I will not call the name of that indoor skating rink. Not ice skating, but, you know, wheel skating. And when I was a little boy, I remember there was a gentleman, uh, a boy my age in there one day. He must have bumped into five people and just started a fight right there on the floor. And at that time, they didn't throw you out of the skating ring. I'll never forget as long as I live. And it was my turn. He bumped into me. And before I knew it, we were on the floor fighting. And he was getting the better out of me, I'll admit it. But I recognized something. I recognized that I was a better person than he. Not only that, I recognized 
that there was some good in him that was broken. People were feeding the darkness. I think later on we discovered that he may have had a mental illness. He was emotionally disturbed. Someone set him off like you set off a, an animal. And he was fighting everyone. But I remember caring about him. When you are in Jesus Christ and someone is screaming and hollering at you, I believe there's still a part of something inside of you. A part, call it the Holy Ghost, call it wisdom, call it understanding, call it Jesus' love, whatever you want to call it. When men and women are at their worst toward you, there's something inside of you that recognizes their need for redemption, their need for healing, their need to be a better person. At no point in time as a Christian do you ever feel that someone is so bereft of worth and value that you have the right to dismiss or destroy them. I can't explain it. But even when they're treating you at their worst, you still find worth within yourself and worth within them. Four, what does it mean when you're able to hold your peace? It means you have self-control. He that can control his tongue can control the city. If you have the ability to be prudent with your tongue and not say everything that comes to mind and not use your words like weapons, but instead use your words as fountains of healing and blessing, that's because the Spirit of God has given you a level of control and discipline where the blessings of the universe come your way. A nasty attitude, a bad attitude, brings bitterness and evil, bad weather, a bad environment, misfortune come to you. But when your heart is right with God, when you're living in peace yourself, good seems to chase you down and overtake you. You have control. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for the Spirit of God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. I like the King James better. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but power, dunamis, agape, and self-control, discipline. The reason why we can hold our peace when men and women are arguing, and we want to fight back. Don't get me wrong. You want to give back as much as you're getting. But something inside of you says no, and you've got the grace of God to hold your peace. Five, what happens when the conflict is going on and you're holding your peace? You are trying to inform, not win. That is so important. Because when someone wants to fight you, they want to win. But you who are in Christ, you're not trying to win. It's not about winning. It's not about gloating for you. It's about informing. It's about teaching. It's about reconciling. It's about bringing about love. It's not about winning for you because you're a child of God. Remember how you hear those songs, you know, uh, hold your peace and the Lord will fight your battle? This is what I'm talking about. This is real. Someone said something about you that's horrible on social media. Others have joined in. Someone has called you out of your name. Someone has said something hurtful to you. And you're holding your peace. You're thinking about, how am I going to respond to this? You will respond according to the Spirit of God. You're not trying to win. You're trying to inform. Six, they're barking at you. You're holding your peace. You do not want to walk in sin. No matter what someone else is doing, you, you do not want to sin against God. 
somehow in the back of your mind you know that the Lord is watching, that the Lord may even be testing you at this time. So something inside tells you to hold your peace. And seven, you trust the Holy Spirit. So someone is barking at you, right? I, I'm using the word barking because I mean someone is speaking angrily at you. And you are calm and meek. You're not running away. You're calm and meek and holding your peace. Why? Because you trust the Holy Spirit to be at work at that very moment. And the longer you restrain yourself and the longer you hold your peace, and the longer you try to inform and not try to win, the Holy Spirit is operating and working to transform that heart and mind. And the devil could be becoming more angry, and yet God is working on that person's heart to take, to absorb and suck the wrath and rage and evil and jealousy and vengeance out of their hearts. The more you remain calm, and the more you remain restrained and disciplined, and the more you hold your peace. That's why a soft answer turns away wrath. Let's open this up a little bit more. Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Remember, you cannot determine what someone else is going to do. But as long as it depends on you, be at peace. I'm not going to fight you, brother. I'm not going to fight you, sister. I'm not going to get into it. Let's talk about it later. Let's work it out another way. Sometimes you may have to pay back what you did not steal, even if that's the case. You are walking in the Spirit of God. You are walking in peace. Hear me now. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called God's children. Amen. Praise the Lord. There are two main reasons for conflict. There's two main reasons someone will attack you verbally. One, you're being attacked by the accuser, by the devil. Or two, you are receiving God's discipline. You know, sometimes when we are in the flesh as Christians, or when we've done wrong, when we've disobeyed, when we've transgressed against the Lord, sometimes the chastening rod of God will come through the ungodly. And remember David when he sinned against Bathsheba and uh, Gabrielle's wife, I believe her name was Gabrielle, came against David. Shimei came against David. And David's general wanted to kill him. He said, no, the Lord has allowed this. Sometimes people come at you because the Lord has allowed it. The Lord wants to correct something in your life. Or the Lord is doing this to bring about some form of discipline, some correction in your behavior. Man, I've got so much to cover. Now I'm going to make a series of strong declarative statements. Some I'll support with scripture and we'll conclude. When you are in an argument, when someone is trying to argue with you, husband or wife, stranger, friend, whoever it is, hear me what I'm telling you now. Put it up on the screen for me, Bobby. Do not Worry about saving face. Know who you are in Jesus Christ. Because the devil is going to use someone you love and say, you're going to let them do that to you? You're going to let them get away with that? And they're only provoking it more. I told you many years ago, and I want to tell you again, that when you're really growing in the spirit of God, one of the major spiritual attacks you will receive is when the devil will come after your reputation. If 
Well, I'll, I'll, let me hold my peace on that. You will know when the devil comes after your reputation that God is blessing you. You will know this. And you need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. It's one of the most important principles that I can teach you, that I can encourage you about. Know who you are. No matter who's yelling and screaming at you, know who you are in Jesus Christ. I love this scripture in 1 Peter 3. I love it. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Listen, here it is, keeping a clear conscience, knowing who you are, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, I believe we're living in a day of scoffers where men and women will talk about you and they may never admit that they were wrong, but in their hearts they know. It may be their agenda to slander your name and destroy you, but in their hearts they will know, as long as you know, as long as your conscience is clear and your heart is right with God and you're dealing with it with respect and love, men and women may come at you all kinds of ways, but know who you are in Jesus Christ. Woo, man. Hallelujah. Praise God. Next. The truth liberates. The truth liberates. Even when men and women do not want to hear it or accept it, the truth becomes the standard and the defense of the one speaking the truth. People come to me all the time for counseling. Bishop, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to resolve this? What do I do about this? Tell the truth. Don't tell the truth to win. Tell the truth because the truth will stand. The truth lasts. The truth will always be there. A lie has to be told over and over and over and over again. But the truth will stand up all by itself on one leg. Tell the truth. And the truth will always be your defense. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with truth. That's a part of the armor of God. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So when someone is barking at you, continue to speak the truth in love, because the truth will liberate. It will always be the standard. It will always be there. Amen. And it will always be your defense. Always speak the truth in love. I'm almost done. And when you're in conflict with someone and or there's someone's in conflict with you, never forget the principle of redemptive love. Praise God. This is where redemptive love comes into view, comes into place. This is what it means to love your enemies and bless those that curse you. Someone is barking. Someone is fighting. Someone is loud. They've been loud a long time. They've been loud for weeks. They've been loud for months. They've been nasty as long as you've known them. Find something to hold on to to, to remind you that your strength is in your long suffering. Now, I'm pausing my words, I'm looking for the right word, because this is not natural now. It's not natural, it's not common, it's extraordinary. But remember the Lord said, if you do what everyone else does, how, how are you as a Christian any different than everyone else? It's when men and women treat you at, at when they're treating you as badly as they can, and you're standing at your best. You're doing it because you're hoping. Man, I'm, I'm fighting back the tears now. 
You're doing this because you want the Lord to win. You want the Lord to use you. You want the Lord to save them. Let me ask you this question. Would you rather be separated from all your enemies? Or would you rather the Lord win your enemies and have them honor you for your stance in Jesus Christ? Let me move on quickly. From a very, from a very practical point of view, depending on the level of hostility, do not remain in a situation. Instead, intercede for the person. There are times of conflict when it is best for you not to remain in that situation. Look at this scripture with me quickly. Take note of it in Proverbs 4, 14 and 15. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on that path. Turn from it and go your own way. There are times in your life where you need to say to yourself, I'm, I'm sorry, I will never come to an understanding about this matter and I have to leave. I have to go. And you need to leave the situation. And you need to walk away from the person. Just go. Let it go. I want to talk to you women who have been in abuse. You've moved in with a fella, and that fella is an abuser. And now your life is in danger, and God told you to leave. Don't go back to get your favorite pair of shoes, or your coat, or your couch, or your television, or even your telephone. Walk, leave, walk away. Your, your God is a provider. Jehovah Jireh. Whatever you lose, whatever the canker worm steals from you, the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have taken from you. God will give it back to you. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I sense the Holy Spirit telling me to tell you Walk away, darling. Leave. Leave tonight. Walk away. And the Lord will, the Lord will darken your footsteps so the one who's harmed you will not be able to find you. Praise the living God. Jesus says in Matthew 5 and 4, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. That's going to the last note that I, that I was sharing. You know, you, you can love a person and not be with them. You can pray for a person and still remove yourself from that situation. Do not put your foot in the path of the wicked. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to gain. You've done all you can do. Leave. Next, do not keep a record of wrongs. Keep a record of prayer. Now, this is the one admonition that I'm giving someone in conflict now that's kind of tricky. Don't rehearse the wrong. But you may need to write down what you've done, place and time, and to put it in the spiritual context, write down where you were in your heart. You know, Lord, this is where I was. This is what happened, and this is how I responded. Write it down, date and time, time stamp it. You may need it one day. Let me give you an example of this in the Psalms. Psalm 59, write it down. Psalm 5, 9, 1 through 4. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are, who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those 
who are after my blood. See how they lie and wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they're ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. God, take note of what I'm going through. All of Psalm 59 is a record of the psalmist telling God what happened when his enemies came after him. So sometimes, saint of God, you do not need to keep a record of wrongs, but you need to keep a record of prayer. You need to write down what happened, document it in your journal, and document the way you handled it in the name of Jesus. And find a witness. It's always good to share with someone who can verify your experience. If you're ever in a situation and, and, and the conflict is bad and no reconciliation has taken place and you know that you're right and standing in the truth, share it with someone else. They may already know what this spirit is like. Share with them because the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 19 and 15 of one witness it's not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense that they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Paul said the same thing. If there's another witness, someone can say, you know what, you're right about that. You're right about what you've done. You're right about that person. You're right about the situation. And that may be the only consolation you have in that matter of conflict. Now, I want you to hear me like you've never heard me before. I know the hour's getting late. I looked up at the clock here at the sanctuary, but I want you to hear what I'm telling you now. I learned this from my own experience, and I've saved this for last, and this is the entire point of my lesson. If you are in conflict right now, if someone has slandered you or called you out of your name or lied on you right now, or they're fighting, making accusations, against you that are not of God, I want you to write this down. I want you to remember this. Go ahead, Bobby. Whatever lie the accuser makes against you is the area where God is getting ready to promote you. I want you to hear me. I want you to understand what I'm telling you. You are living in the midst of spiritual warfare and when the enemy comes at some aspect of your life or character or personality, that's the area that God is getting ready to bless and, and transfer fortune and elevation and promotion. Let me give you some examples. I wrote it down. I'll give you two. Hear me. Remember this for the rest of your life. If someone falsely accuses you of stealing money, it means that God is getting ready to send you success. Help me, Holy Spirit. If someone accuses you of being a liar when you know that you've told the truth, it means God is getting ready to give you authority and influence. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. What am I trying to tell you? Let me say it another way. If someone accuses you of stealing what that and they're falsely accusing you what that means is that God is getting ready to pour great resources upon you God is getting ready to open up the windows of heaven and what Satan has tried to stop it and block it before it happens because Satan sees what God is getting ready to do for you down the road Satan recognizes that favor is coming and is attacking you before the favor arrives. So if the devil accuses you of stealing, it's because God is getting ready to give you resources. Praise God. If someone is going after your character, it's because God is getting ready to use that character to raise you up and give you authority and influence. The devil is always trying to come at you beforehand. So whatever area that Satan is attacking you in, let me give you another example. 
say that Satan is attacking you in your marriage, that, some, that something is going on between you and your spouse, and it seems as though your spouse has turned against you, God is getting ready to raise you up spiritually. God is getting ready to give you spiritual authority because Satan is using the most important person in your life to break your spirit because God is getting ready to raise you up and give you authority. Never forget, there's no conflict that will come your way that is not of God, that God is not doing something in your life as a result of it. So, the Bible says the soft, the tender answer turns away wrath. It's meant to appease a matter and end the conflict, and eventually it will. Even if it means that you have to be the one to walk away, I want to repeat, don't worry about saving face. He who thought it not robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation. There's no saving face on the cross. He didn't save face, but he died for you and died for me. And what happened? God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I know I've gone longer than I should. One more thing, by holding your peace, you exemplify the character of Jesus Christ. A soft answer turns away wrath. You hold your peace when, when the devil is barking at you. And I close with this scripture. He committed no sin, Jesus. And no deceit was found in his mouth. He didn't say the wrong thing. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to his father who judges, judges justly. Blessed Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the word of God and I'm appealing to you now on behalf of men and women who may be in the midst of conflict right now in their marriage somehow, somehow in their life they may be going through and I pray to you now in Jesus' name, to bring about their deliverance. Help them to remain faithful, to entrust you, because you are getting ready to do something magnificent in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll talk to you a little bit more in a few minutes about, um, about this. And the music ministry is going to come back and sing right now, I'm going to ask you to give to the Lord tonight. Morning Star does not operate other businesses. We live by the tithes and offerings of the saints and what God has done for us in ministry. So give to the Lord here. Follow the announcements. God bless you. I have an everlasting covenant with God. My offering is the sacred portion of my life. God's resources are tied to me, and I will give as long as I live. Giving of our tithes and offerings is an act of collective sacrifice. We give so that no one among us will suffer lack. Our cheerful giving signifies our unity with one another as believers and our confidence in God. We pray that by now most of you have gotten the hang of giving electronically, but just in case you haven't, or may be new to our church, Here's how easy it is to join in giving. Simply text MSBC to the number 77977. You will receive a text message and you can follow the prompts from there to complete your giving. And as always, you can give by check using the information listed on the screen. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving and for your courage in sacrificing for the benefit of our church our community and the spread of the gospel throughout the world. Father, we love you. Father, we 
worship you. Father, we are in awe of who you are. Father, we exalt you because of who you are.
nothing will prove your faith in Christ more than how you handle conflict. It's not about how often you go to church. It's how you believe and trust under pressure. This is an example of true faith because what we're talking about tonight, you cannot do without Jesus Christ living inside of you. And if you have not accepted him as Savior, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe he died for my sin. I believe he was wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities. And the chastisement I deserve fell upon him. And through his stripes, I am saved. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved today. And I ask you to unite with some house of worship, preferably Morningstar. If you're living in the area, find us. God spare our lives. We'll be here Sunday to share with you. We love you. We're living in an age of conflict, but by the grace of God, you will be exalted. You can and will rise above it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And let all the people of God say, Amen.